Hi, everybody. Welcome to Popwire. This is Danny. Today, we have a really special guest with us. Their name is Marguerite Hannah, and they play Ashley on Reginald the Vampire on Sci-Fi. How's it going, Marguerite? It's going good. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to have you hanging out with me tonight. Thank you for, for showing up. <laughs> I mean, what an honor. I'm excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> uh, so Reginald the Vampire, it's a brand new show on Sci-Fi. Um, for those out there who haven't watched it, can you give us a, a little summary about the show? Yes. Um, yeah, Reginald the Vampire is about a dude named Reginald, and he's he starts off the show, you know, pretty down on his luck and having a hard time. Um, you know, sometimes it can be really tough growing up in this world. He feels like he doesn't belong. He gets bullied for the way he looks. Um, so it's really understandable that he's feeling pretty down on himself. And I think throughout the show, we follow him in his journey to like to love himself and be on his own team. Cause I think he starts to understand that yes, there's like obstacles outside of him, but there's also some of this is manifesting because of how he feels about himself and that has real impacts on the people around you, the people who care about you, if you're not rooting for yourself and if you don't know how to take care of yourself. And I think he kind of has to decide if he's going to believe, you know, the haters and believe what the world says about him or if he's going to try to make something of himself and demand better. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great description. And um, and vampires, vampires and, and vampires. Of course, there's lots of vampires in the show. Um, <laughs> um, would you say that? I know I'm kind of skipping ahead, but would you say that for Reginald? I mean, becoming a vampire. Like, do you think that finally helped him sort of gain confidence in himself? I think. Oh, that's such a good question. I think like yes and no, because the whole thing is that it enhances what, what you've already got going on, like when your turn, that just kind of gets like tripled or... Mm -hmm. The good and the bad, right? Exactly. Like yeah. everything just gets intensified as a vampire. And so like, you know, it's this thing where he's like not a huge fan of what he's got going on. And then that gets intensified as a vampire. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the crossroads. That's That's when he has to face it. And that's when he has to either like decide if he's going to be like a good guy or a bad guy. If he's either going to like accept that he doesn't like himself and he doesn't, as a result, he doesn't make good choices. Or if he's going to realize that he actually had some really amazing qualities and that also got amplified. Mm -hmm. So I think the vampire thing was like the moment of truth where like he couldn't, he couldn't put off like that decision anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I like the way you put that, the moment of truth. It was like this, yeah, a crossroads that he came yeah. across and he had to, he had to make that decision for himself finally. Yeah, he had to decide what road he was going to go down. Yeah. Wow, that's such a good message. <laughs> um, so um, I want to talk about Ashley, your character, but first I want to hear about you. How did you get into acting? Please tell us about yourself. How I got into acting. Oh my God. Uh, so I, when I was in grade four, <laughs> um, so my school, my elementary school went from junior kindergarten to grade six. And when I was in grade four, we got this new teacher in and his name was Mr. Heaney. He was super cool. And he really loved putting on musicals for the, for the, so for the first time, our school was putting on plays and musicals and stuff. And I, I was a pretty exuberant kid with the people I knew and trusted, like my friends and family. But outside of that, I was an incredibly shy kid. And um, so I, I auditioned for the school musical in grade four. And I had like the most horrific stage fright. And I was asked to sing a song. And I couldn't think of a song. And they were like, just sing happy birthday. And I literally was like, oh. <laughs> My goodness like you could barely oh. hear <laughs> um so i got put in the chorus and it's so fascinating when i think back to this i remember when i got the script for the play it was schoolhouse rock and i 
would lock myself in the bathroom at home and I memorized every single line of every single character, and every single song. And I think I memorized the whole thing in the matter of a few days. And I just like would impatiently sit there in rehearsals while like all the leads were forgetting their lines. And I'd be like, I know all their lines, like I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> so prepared. <laughs> I was just so enthralled by it. And I just like remembered just longing. I would just sit there in the background. I longed so much to be them and to be in their position. So grade five rolls around and we're doing the Wizard of Oz. And none of us, none of us grade fivers are supposed to get lead roles because the grade sixers, the ones who are graduating are supposed to get them. And I just remember being like, I'm just gonna go for it. Like I had no concept about if I could sing at all, if I was any good at this. And I was so scared, but I was just like, I'm just going to take a risk and I'm just going to give it all I got and see what happens. And I like vividly remember me making that choice for myself. <laughs> and it turns out I was really good at it. <laughs> and I got Dorothy. The and, like the lead role. Like I got the, literally like to this wow. day back to my school. And my teachers have no idea who I like my old teachers have no idea who I am. But once you're like, I'm Dorothy, they're like, oh, my God, right, Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you have a legacy of Dorothy. That's I have a legacy in Ottawa <laughs> of being Dorothy in grade five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, anyways, I just like, I, I loved it. And now here we are. <laughs> hey, that is quite the origin story. I love Thank it. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Little Mar, little child Marguerite, just, just taking a risk, giving it their all. <laughs> yeah. It, so, so is Ashley your your first part on television, on mainstream yeah. television? I'd never, like, not even for, like, a one-liner or anything. I'd never set foot on a TV and film set before this. You're kidding me. No. Like, you, hey, you really are a natural, like. Oh, really? <laughs> no, wow. I literally, it was hilarious because I had, I eventually had to, like, out myself because I had no idea what to do, where to go. I didn't understand half the lingo that the director was telling me to do. So I outed myself pretty quickly as someone who had no idea what was going on. <laughs> well, yeah, you're doing fantastic. So. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm really blessed. I, I feel so lucky that they took a chance on me. Um, and I just, like, yeah, I just feel so blessed to be a part of this production. So, so tell us who Ashley is. How would you describe them? Oh my God, Ashley. Freaking love of my life, honestly. Ashley <laughs> is um, so different for me in so many ways. Like I, I'm a bit of a people pleaser and I'm really like, um, I have kind of like a, a big personality. I don't know, I'm, I'm exuberant. And Ashley's not, Ashley's none of those things. Ashley, that just doesn't play by your rules, does not care what you think, is so unapologetically like passionate about what they're passionate about and so unapologetically quirky and dedicated and just honestly just doesn't care what you think. I remember when I got the part of Ashley in my audition, um, something I thought a lot about was, I thought a lot about so I'd recently gone to one of those restaurants where it's pitch black and you like can't even see your hand this far from your face. What? What is this? I've never heard of that. No. Yeah, there's this chain of restaurants. I think the one in Vancouver is called like the Dark Table or something. I think there's one in Montreal and Toronto. Anyways, there's this chain where literally it's pitch black in the restaurant. You can't see a thing. Whoa. And <laughs> so it makes the eating experience really interesting. There's like an option where you just tell them your dietary restrictions and they give you a surprise menu and you don't know you have to like figure out what you're eating what? so what i found really crazy about this experience is that it's incredible the social nicety like the things that you take for granted that you think just come naturally like all your facial expressions all your hand gestures all of it that you just think is the way you talk to people it all just falls away when you realize you don't need it anymore and so I would be sitting there like with my eyes closed, just like shoveling food in my face with my hands, <laughs> no one could see me. And I like would look totally uninterested, but I would just make sure, because I would be interested in the conversation, but I only needed to show it through my voice. And it's just amazing, all of the social niceties that just fall away when you don't think you need them anymore. Wow. And I thought of Ashley, I was just like, 
Ashley's always at the dark table. <laughs> Ashley just like doesn't really think that most social niceties are necessary and doesn't feel that they need to operate using those in mm -hmm. order to like get what they want, get their point across. So Ashley's just always at the dark table. <laughs> ah, no, that's a that's a great way to describe them. I mean, I I think that's one of the things that I appreciate about, appreciate about them is that they're straight to the point, very blunt, um, yeah. but also very caring too. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, they're really, really loyal. They're, they're not very quick to trust and they're not very quick to let you in. But when they do, like they do, they're loyal as heck. They will go to the ends of the earth for the people they love, but they're just, they're not gonna like, smile for you if they don't think it's relevant to the conversation <laughs> mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah so how much of this that you're telling me right now was actually written for you versus like what you created for ashley i mean like i there's only so much i feel comfortable taking credit for because it's like you know I, I got all my inspiration from the writers and what they made um but for the audition all they told me was that yeah, pretty much the biggest note they had in the audition was that she, uh, that it, it was she at the time, that uh, they're deadpan. Mm. And they just want a really, really deadpan uh, delivery. And that was, and that they're like really into conspiracy theories and stuff like that. And I think that's all I got. Um, yeah. And then the rest, I just kind of, I, I remember I read the audition and I was like, oh, so we've got a little sprinkle of like, April Ludgate from <laughs> Parks and Rec. We got a little sprinkle of Aubrey Plaza in here. And I, I oh my gosh, Audrey Plaza, yeah. Totally. Oh, my hero, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so how did you learn about the role of Ashley? My agent just sent it to me. <laughs> okay. My amazing, brilliant, wonderful agent, um, who sends me really wonderful stuff all the time. Uh yeah. Uh, she sent it to me and I was like, yes, because I, I love comedy. I'm very, I watch too much TV and it's all comedy and I love it so much. And so when I saw that there was this comedy show about like fantasy stuff too, I also love mm -hmm. fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh yes, let me add it. <laughs> yeah. I think Reginald has like that perfect ratio of dark and comedy, you know, like yeah. it's, because it's pretty gory. Like there's some parts where, you know, the characters are like feeding off of other people and I'm just like, oh God, I can't even watch that. And I'm like, I, I'm pretty good with gore, but the, I think it's the sound effects. These sound effects are intense. You know what it is too? It's like, it's how into like Reg, like Jacob just goes for it. It's like the fact that he's like reveling in it so much. You're just like, huh. <laughs> you know what See? I mean? Yeah, he makes it like look so good, which is just like weird to think about. You're like, hey, it's I feel wrong. So I should <laughs> objectively, it's so gross. And like it's so funny because Jacob leans into it too. Like he leans into making it look disgusting, but like Reginald is just like so desperate and just needs it so it's also the desperation. The desperation makes it gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, that totally makes me think about oh I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's probably the sound and props and stuff, but it's also Jacob. He he knows how to make it gross. He's a master. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a little bit ago, you briefly touched on Ashley's pronouns being she. What? How did that change? Um. Oh my God, it was so great. So Ashley, when I got the audition, uh, it was she, her. It was female. Um, and then I got the part. And you know, you get like before filming starts, you get all these drafts of all the, all the episodes. And then at one point I got the new drafts for the episodes they had written. And all of a sudden, like I started noticing they pronouns. And at first I thought it was a mistake. At first I was like, oh, what a funny grammatical error. Ha ha ha. And then I kept reading and I was like, wow, they're really making this mistake a lot. <laughs> And then eventually I was like, I think after reading like three episodes where they changed all the pronouns to they, them, I was like, wait a second, I think they did this on purpose. And I realized later that um, I sign off all my emails with my pronouns. Um, and I realized later that uh, somebody that I was emailing back and forth with had caught that 
and basically pitched to, um, I think what happened from what I understand is that they pitched to maybe Harley. I don't know, somewhere, somehow, someone caught wind that I had they, them pronouns, and basically they decided to change Ashley to they, them pronouns uh, as well to honor me. And I remember when I had put two and two together and I realized that it was on purpose, I started crying. I was crying happy tears because that never happens. You being a non-binary person, playing a non-binary character on like a, you know, a main mainstream television show, like... What does that mean for the non-binary community? What is, like, why is that so important? <sighs> yeah, no, it's a fantastic question. Representation is, is so, so important. It, it holds such a power that I think is really underestimated. Um, because we're talking about dismantling systemic oppression, ultimately, when we're looking at having representation and speaking those stories. Um, yeah, so the main, one of like the big things that keeps systemic oppression in, in play is isolation. So a great way to um, keep the status quo in place is to make people who are not benefiting from the status quo, to make them feel like they are isolated in their experience um and when then when you isolate someone it's really easy to manipulate them it's really easy to gaslight them make them feel like their experience isn't happening make them feel like um they're actually the ones who are wrong for bringing it up and it's just really easy to do all of that uh and kind of stifle their voice and take it away so a great way to combat that is to break that isolation and to like form communities and where people can see their own experiences being reflected in others, and then they don't feel like they're alone. And then it's harder to tell someone who doesn't feel alone in their experience that their experience isn't valid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so there's a great power in that connection and in that visibility and in that community, in creating community. And then also like creating that community lets people, um, when people feel seen and they feel validated, then they can start to heal as well and people who are healing are more difficult to control as well so like i think the tv and film industry actually has this incredible ability to either dismantle the status quo and dismantle system help to dismantle systemic oppression or to bolster it and solidify it um and i think it does both uh and the reason it it's such a fantastic tool for dismantling systemic oppression is because of the sheer audience base it can reach. You can reach people and also the sheer intimacy of it. Like you can break that isolation for like thousands upon thousands of people. If you tell stories about empowered queer people, if you tell stories about really <laughs> the endless amount of people who suffer from systemic oppression. If you tell their stories, then all of a sudden there's, there's that connection happening. You're bracing, you're breaking that isolation. And that is so powerful. And it's, it, and it's also a tool for mass education. And it's just like, stories are just so much more powerful than we give them credit for. You know, like, have you ever watched a show and then like seen a character go through something and, and then you're just like, oh, and just had that touch, like this intimate part of you that maybe you didn't even know was there. And then you're just like, oh my God, like I feel so seen. And I, I feel like, I feel so empowered to like move through the world, even though I'm hurt, you know, I don't know. It's, it's amazing. So I think that's why visibility matters. Visibility matters because we have got to, we've got to, We've got to break that isolation. We've got to connect people. We've got to heal people. And like, and it's not even just showing like pain on TV and film. It's also showing joy. We got to show people that they are entitled to joy and to freedom and to just living a life that is safe. And if you can even just show that on TV and film, that is powerful. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's why I think 
putting non-binary people, like speaking for myself and the intersections that I live in, like it's important, like, it's so impactful for me when I see non-binary people, when I see queer people, um, I'm assigned female at birth. So when you see women who are just rising up in their personal power, it makes me feel like I can do that too. Yeah, no, totally. You hit on so many good, good points. Um, yeah, I, and, you know, not only is it like very beneficial for our community, the queer community, but for people who don't belong to our community, seeing us on the, on screen, maybe for, maybe for people with, that aren't within the community that maybe aren't even exposed to queer people, but being able to see that representation, representation on screen, it kind of allows them to have some sort of connection with that character. So not only do we need the representation visibility, but it has to be positive visibility. It has to be accurate, you know, not just this trope that for years queer people were, were put in, you know, we were put in a box and um, the queer community is so diverse. And I mean, I could go on for hours about it. Oh my God, that was so gorgeously said. And I 100% agree with that. And that's why it's so important to have those people like in the writing room. It's so important to have those people because everybody's got their like unconscious biases. And when, and like, we're talking about queer people. So like, no, but like, I'm not saying like, straight writers or straight showrunners or directors or actors or what have you can't like deeply empathize with the queer struggle and can't educate themselves on it and can't can't create a story that's that's queer and also beautiful i'm not at all saying that but i am saying that like a straight person will never know what it is to live a queer life better than a queer person mm -hmm. and they are very likely to be carrying in their own unconscious biases and because we've been raised in a heteronormative environment, how could you not? And so it's this thing where it's so important to have queer writers, queer directors, queer actors, queer people telling our own stories so that we you can have that authentic lived experience that mm -hmm. like, that is hidden, that is, like there's so much about being queer that is hard to explain to someone that's never lived it. You know, like it's, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> I didn't like, like, it took me a really, really long time to embrace my queerness in like the fullness that I've embraced it now. And I, I still have a ways to go. But like, even me who like, had an inkling that something was going on most of my life was like, still didn't see what the our heteronormative society was until like a couple years ago, where I kind of was like, Oh, God, now I get it. You know, <laughs> like, even me as a queer person was ignorant to it for most of my life. So I don't know, you just you need, you need queer people in the positions of power when it comes to telling our stories or else, or else you might just be recycling tropes and then, mm -hmm. and then what are we doing, you know? So anyways, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just jumping off what you said. You kind of said yeah. that already. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, and and we need the, the allies too. Allies are super important in those spaces to, yeah. to help uplift the queer community or any marginalized person um, that can represent a marginalized community. That's, yeah, it's very important. There's still ways to go. There's still work that we have to do, but um, we are seeing progress. And I think that's super yeah. important. And I have to give kudos to sci-fi because I think that, you know, their last handful of of new series that they've put out there Reginald included like they um they are giving us diversity in many different ways yeah. and it's it's awesome <laughs> yeah, they are they're doing a pretty I, they're doing a good job I'm impressed um and even yeah even just Reginald the Vampire itself that's it's an exciting thing to see yeah totally even just like even that whole thing with changing my characters pronouns to they them like that's huge that's so cool. They didn't have to do that at all. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I guess just, I have one more question sort of related to this topic that we're, that we're on right now. Um, from what you've experienced so far in the television industry, is there anything, like, do you have any suggestions, I guess, for the industry right. at large that would help sort of keep this 
progress moving forward? Mm, I mean, that's a toughie. Um, I have a very limited like view of the, there's so many different roles and jobs in the industry and I'm, I just kind of see it from an actor's point of view. So I have a very limited view. And also I'm a very new, I'm very, very new to the industry. I've just done, um, like for TV and film, I've just done this one job. Um, so that said, I think I really like it when I see in an audition breakdown that they're prioritizing authentic casting. So prioritizing queer actors to play queer roles. I just keep talking about queerness. This applies to like so many other <laughs> <laughs> um, of, of demographics. Um, but um, yeah, so just uh, using queerness as an example. Um, yeah, I think, I think prioritizing authentic casting is fantastic. And is a, cause you know, like we deserve to get paid to tell our own stories. <laughs> yeah. <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> Even just talk about queerness, like statistically speaking, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure statistically speaking, straight actors dominate queer roles still to this day. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there's some questions to be asked about that. And also like, you know, like queer people don't just exist in our, in stories and in our imaginations, we're real people. <laughs> so it's great to put us on, to put characters that are queer, but it, it's even greater when you have real people telling that story as well. Anyways, I'm, I digress, but so I think to come back to your question, I think that, um, yeah. From an actor's perspective, I can say prioritizing um, authentic casting will do immeasurably good things for the production. It also it also contributes, like the more once again, like not just stopping at at having the characters represent those things, but also like having real people, like writers, producers, what have you, be part of that demographic it creates this environment on set as well, which like, like I can say as a queer person, if I'm the only queer or out queer person on set, if I'm the only one I know of on set, um, that that's a different environment than being in a room full of other queer people. It just is. And so when we're telling queer stories, for example, it's, it's so important to have enough people who have lived that experience and just just have an embodied understanding of what that is. Um, and like a real wise knowledge of what that is to kind of set the tone and create the atmosphere and give permission to like, to like talk about certain things and bring up certain things. Um, so when it comes to trying to tell a good story and an authentic story, it's just so important to have real people in the room to create a certain culture on set and i think god writers we need we need writers and and yeah like not just actors but people in power writers and, and showrunners executive producers um who kind of like create the show from its from its first inception um we need we need people who know what they're talking about you know mm -hmm. <laughs> that we need people who can own those stories to be telling those stories. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of switching gears now, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for Reginald the vampire, um, they have some interesting twists to the vampire lore. Um, right. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about that. What are your thoughts? Okay. Vampire lore um my thoughts are you know what like i'm into it i i like the fact i think it's really cool this whole idea of like what you're originally what you originally bring to the table as a person like once you get turned then all of that gets magnified it's not just like a one size fits all like everyone has super speed everyone is whatever um I like how that gets magnified. That's really cool. It makes it feel like a more individualistic, like complex process. I think that's neat. It's nuanced. 
Um, <laughs> I I like the rules of like, I like the idea of like your body will tell you when you need to feed. And I just like mm -hmm. watching Reginald go through the motions of trying to like deny what his body wants. And I guess that's not necessarily new. I guess a lot of vampire shows are like that, but I feel like it was packaged in this way that's like, I don't know. I feel like other vampire shows are just like, you got to feed and that's it. But this was yeah, no, totally. And it's like, that's like your body will, will let you know. And that there's like an intimacy there. And I don't know. It made the stakes. It raised the stakes for me. Yeah, I, I'm into it. Yeah, like touching on the whole like feeding thing. That was one of the things that have has really st stood out to me. Like they're able to almost live a normal life. Because, yeah, they can eat normal. You know, because they can they can control themselves more than, than not, other vampires that we see in other stories. It's not what we do in the shadows rules where yeah. you, you fry your like puking blood up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, uh, I that's I was actually just talking to a friend about this um, for for Reginald and Maurice especially. They seem very human to me. You know, the whole reason why Maurice turned, or yeah, turned um, Reginald is because he's a sucker for romance. Like he saw how he was looking at Sarah and it's like, oh, that's really sweet, actually, you know? It is. And it's so cute, too, because he's so like broody, cool guy energy. Yeah. But then he's just like, oh, God, I got to give this this lover boy a shot. I got to yeah. let him He's charming. <laughs> he can't die yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. And then, you know, there's there's a very strong message in the show about body positivity, mm -hmm. and so just like the physical image that we have of vampires is changing. I've actually okay. I gotta say, like, I'm not a vampire expert by any means. Um, I I totally fumble every time. They're like, "Who's your favorite vampire?" Like historically <laughs> speaking, do you like Nosferatu or like Dracula? And I'm like, I don't know who any of those people are. <laughs> don't look at me. Um, but so <laughs> so I'm pretty ignorant on vampire lore. But as far as I have seen so far, like I haven't seen a fat vampire yet. I haven't seen. I rarely even see vampires that aren't white. Like mm -hmm. I'm pretty so true about I feel like this is new. Um and also like, you know, I grew up on like the early two thousands vampires of like Twilight and like the vampire diaries. That is a very different <laughs> vein of vampire than than what Reginald the vampire is serving up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that has stayed true for the vampire lore and, and Reginald is is the queerness. There's like this very strong underlying of queerness. And, and I think that's great that the show incorporated that. That's awesome. I like that a lot. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard I gotta start watching Buffy because I heard it's super queer and great. Oh my gosh, you haven't seen Buffy? I know, I know, I know. I'm a failure as a, as a queer person. I haven't seen Buffy, um, but uh, I've heard that's pretty queer and pretty exciting, so. Apparently vampires are pretty, are pretty gay. I like it. Yeah. I would say Buffy is fantastic. My only really large critique is that they follow that whole barrier gaze trope, <clears throat> um, which is tough. But other than that, sorry? What gaze? Oh, barrier gaze. So they, they, they kill off um, a queer character. Oh, damn it. Yeah. So that that's the only crappy part about Buffy um but it's otherwise it's it's a really fun show it's very quirky and, and campy and um you should definitely watch it <laughs> I love it I also love that like I feel like sometimes vampire shows can like they're only queer because vampires are just like uncontrollably horny this <laughs> 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 like, is like part of vampire lore um but I like it when they're very purposely like no no, it's more than that. We're we're developing real queer relationships that have to do with like personality and connection and not just like I'm a vampire. I have yeah, no. So you totally just reminded me. Uh another thing about Reginald is is I forget who said it. It was either Maurice or Mike, 
but they referred to the sort of like cohabitating nature of vampires as being nesting. Right. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, (laughs) these are people that are living for for hundreds of years. Of course, they're going to just develop these very like almost domestic (laughs) relationships with each other. (laughs) But yeah. Yeah. I mean, why not? And once again, that's like, that could also be like, I don't think that their relationships like overtly queer in any way, but like there is like, um, there is, what am I trying to say? Like, like so much of queer culture isn't just like sexuality, but is also just like an open-mindedness and a non-binary like way of viewing things. And I feel like that falls into like a type of queer culture where it's just like these wealthy grown adult men you know in like heteronormative society would never be roommates because that would be you know like too gay but like (laughs) these guys are cohabitating with each other and there's something kind of so um so lovely about that and so kind of open-minded and fluid about that where like you know they're not necessarily as as far as we know so far they're not necessarily like a romantic couple but they're just cohabitating and they make dinner together and they they i'm assuming like talk about it, their problems with each other and <laughs> yeah it's very sweet right it it's really like sweet. yeah yeah huh. so I that's still in that. my opinion i would say that still lives in some sort of like queer realm oh yeah i totally agree not sexually than like culturally you know yeah yeah I'm just, huh. I'm just all about the queer <laughs> <laughs> i know it's okay me too you're it. in really good company <laughs> In case I haven't communicated that properly. <laughs> um, so Ashley and Nikki, like, <laughs> can I ship them? Because I really want to. They had such a cute little scene in the, in the park when they first meet. Yeah, it is really cute, isn't it? Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it's cute. Um, I don't know. I don't know. They're... Um no no straightest straightest people in the whole show (laughs) no way no way anything's going on there i i have no idea what you could be picking up on (laughs) okay well just in case stand up together i mean i'm gonna ship them anyways like i've already i've already decided that for myself but uh why don't we make a ship name for them right now oh my god okay i i mean okay my vote is ashkey Okay, yeah, that's mine too. Right, because I feel like Perfect. the only other option is like Nick, Nikki. <laughs> I feel like the only other option is just Nikki, which is already one person's name. Yeah, no, Ashkey. Ashkey. Yeah, Ashkey. <laughs> that's, yay. that's cute. Okay, I'm going to turn it into a hashtag. Yes. Um, <laughs> <I'm> so happy. <laughs> um, yeah, so another really interesting relationship in the show is between Angela and Maurice. I really want to hear your thoughts about their relationship because it is complicated. It is dramatic. It is. I love it. Um, I love the drama. Okay, let's get into this. Um, well, okay, yeah, what do you want to know? I. Oh. Okay, I'll start here. So, obviously, Maurice hates Angela because Angela turned his mother into a vampire and then she offed herself. Right. It's very dramatic. Yeah. Um, Probably wasn't the best way to put it, but she takes her own life (laughs) because, you know, it it goes against her values as a Christian. Right, right. Um, Do you think, do you think that warrants, warrants Morris's hatred for her? Because I almost feel like, I know Angela is not the nicest person, but I feel like at her core, she's a good person. I mean, she was part of like the civil rights movement, you know, like she wants good for the world. Like she wants to see good things happen. So I don't know. I guess my question, (laughs) I guess my question is, do you think by turning his mother into a vampire, do you think she was being malicious? Or do you think she was really <laughs> actually doing it out of the goodness of her heart? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think she was totally being malicious. I think it was such a sassy move. Okay. I think she was just trying to win an argument. I think she, because, okay. 
I'm not saying I'm not saying like I'm against Angela doing this because I love Angela so much. Uh, partly because I love Savannah so much, who plays Angela. Um, but I just think I I live for a good female villain. I just live for it. It's my bread and butter. So I I adore Angela. And um, yeah, I think you know we have to consider. Angela has lived for a very very long time. So I feel like the minutiae of like, you know, little things like other people's lives <laughs> don't matter so much to her. <laughs> Those, uh, it's not as, um, it's not as weighted and significant to her anymore. So I feel like her doing something like toying with another person's life that way and like turning Maurice's mother just to make a point and to win an argument, I feel like I feel like that's all it is for her. She doesn't like, I feel like Maurice is a new vampire at that point and he like, he still like cherishes things like human life and the balance of things and the natural order of things. But Angela's just seen so much at this point and is so jaded that she's just like, it doesn't matter. She's just another person, just another life. What matters is that I'm right. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, I think you're right. I think I was just being way too optimistic because I also really like Angela. <laughs> she can't do any wrong <laughs> but no no like she that's first of all it's part of what i love about her i love a little bit of evil yes yeah and yeah. um i don't think she like that's part of what makes her so lovable is that she's like mm -hmm. a little bit actually evil but also she's not it's not like a one or the other it's a both and she's a little evil and also she's like does have such a good heart and mm -hmm. she does clearly care so much um yeah, I think just sometimes she just gets carried away and she loses patience and she's just like, fuck it, you don't want to listen to me. Then I'm going to turn your mom and then we're going to see what your mom really thinks of vampires and then you're going to know I'm right. <laughs> yeah, so I guess, I guess the last question about Maurice and Angela is, um, why do you think Angela wants to kill Maurice? Like, what would, what would be her motive in that? Why do I think Angela wants to kill Maurice? Yeah, because it's obvious why Maurice wants to kill Angela. She mm -hmm. um, messed up his mom pretty good. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good reason. Um, okay. I mean, strategically speaking, it just makes sense. If someone's trying to kill you, they can't kill you if they're dead, you know? So I think it's a good strategy. But also, who among us? has not wanted to murder an ex. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> and if murder was just like a really easy thing for you, if you were a vampire and you just like, you had a couple murders under your belt already, it's not so shocking anymore. <laughs> I sound, like I sound like I'm advocating for like serial killers. <laughs> you sound like you might be a vampire, actually. <laughs> um, I'm talking about this is really questionable. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, just trying to think of it from their point of view, you know? <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. What's, what's murdering an ex? I, and don't tell me if I'm right, because it'll be t totally a spoiler, but I almost feel like we might see like an enemy to lover situation with them. Okay, I'm not gonna spoil anything. Okay. Um, but I do, I do also have a point to make about your last question about why she'd wanna kill him. As, as we've already seen, there seems to be a little bit of lingering sexual tension with them. And like, you can't hook up with your ex if he's dead. That's another great reason to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Self-control. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's another oh, really good oh point. Right. Scratch that itch, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. <laughs> um, so on the topic of spoilers, um, is there anything <laughs> that, <laughs> is there anything that you can tease us without giving too much away? Because I know that you can't, but. What can I tease? A part of me just wants to tease like completely false things. A part of me just wants to be like, <laughs> remember the red wedding from Game of Thrones? That happens. <laughs> um, let me think. Um, what can I say? I mean, I think there's a lot of like twists and turns coming. Um, in case 
viewers haven't already gleaned this from our conversation, I think the show takes a little bit of a turn for the gay. <laughs> really? You think so? <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I feel safe teasing that. <laughs> um, which people should be thrilled about. I'm excited. I can't wait for like the last few episodes of the season to come out so we can really, we can really party in that zone. Um, there is, I think, I think we can keep an eye on, uh, on Claire. Mm. I'm not going to say why. I just think, I just think that we should keep an eye on children. <laughs> there's a yeah, she's, there's she's another interesting character. Yeah, she's, she's, there, there's been some like, some little hints so far when it comes to her character that I think can sometimes be easy to miss. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh my god now i'm gonna want to rewatch the last five episodes so i'm like what are they talking about <laughs> what am i missing yeah i think that's all i'm allowed i think i think that's all i'm allowed to tease whenever i try whenever people are like what can you tease i always get so scared that i'm gonna say something that's gonna like get me fired yeah <laughs> but i think like... we're in the safe zone okay good good <laughs> well this was super fun Thank you for hanging out. Um, if people want to follow you on social media, what platforms are you on? Um, I am I am on Instagram. I just recently made my account public. <laughs> I have like I have an I have an amazing number of like six hundred followers. <laughs> 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 um, which I know is super modest, but for me, it's a big deal. <laughs> um, so yeah, follow me on Instagram. And I think that's my only, oh, I have a YouTube channel. I'm also a singer. So I have a YouTube what? channel where I post just like either auditions that I've done or just songs I've done for fun. So if you want to see that, you can go there. Um, and is it okay if I just plug one other project? Oh yes, please go for it. Um, Reginald the Vampire is no longer the only thing I've ever been in. Okay. <laughs> another credit. And it's uh, the video game I worked on just released like two days ago, I think. Oh, um, wow. I did motion capture and voiceover for the character called Stapleface in the new Tales from the Borderlands uh, video game. So if Wow, that's awesome. If you have any gamers, you can find the exact opposite of Ashley's character. In that <laughs> right on. That, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. And uh, it was lovely talking to you. I hope we get to do this again soon. Oh my God. I would love that. Let's okay, cool. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure.